as you know, we've been cheering on, on salvation. Uh, the first message I shared was on salvation is finding Christ Jesus and Him alone. The second, uh, what is your value? What is the value of your salvation? Do you value your salvation worth more than anything on this planet? Number three, you must be born again in order to go to heaven. If you don't understand that, it's the full sermons on the net. Go and listen to it. And then uh, number four is being willing to share salvation with any and everyone. That includes the hobo prostitute, whatever you think is the scum of the earth, we are to be open to share with them. Amen. And then lastly, today we're going to be share, I'm going to be sharing on learning to share your faith. Learning to share your faith. How many of you here have friends that are unbelievers? Anyone? Or family that does, that does not know the Lord? Or a loved one, family, friends, anyone, please put up your hand. I would like to see. All of you. Everyone. Okay. Looks like everyone. Okay. May I ask you? Uh oh. Huh, everyone, did everyone put up their hand there? Everyone. Okay. Thank you. Everyone. Right. Just to clarify that all of us have friends or loved one. Or an acquaintance that does not know the Lord. Right, now may I sh ask you to put up your hand. Who of you have ever shared the gospel with that person? Wow, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Not everyone, though. I would dare to say in the kingdom of God that most, most, I would say even up to 90% of Christians have never shared their faith and never will. So-called Christians. Do you think I would be right in saying a stat like that? Hey? Or do you think I'm being a bit unfair? Amen? Amen? And that's a tragedy. And that is why at large the Church of Jesus Christ is in decline. In the mainline church is very much so. In the charismatic evangelical, I don't think that's the case. But most mainline churches, you will be shocked at their lack of knowledge of the Word of God. Why do so few people share the gospel? What would you think is the reason? What, what do you think? Sorry, they're scared of rejection. What else? What else? They don't know. They feel ill-equipped, unable. What else? Come on, why would you, some of you, sometimes those of you that have it, why, why don't you share? You don't have the confidence? Come quickly, what else? Sorry? Language problem? You, you think you don't have the skill and the words to say? Okay, what else? Opening yourself up to people rejecting you, judging you, being critical of you. Okay, what else? I think I've thrown on screen or the next screen you'll see there because uh, I've written a few and they're not exhaustive. You could be shy, you feel unable, you're embarrassed, ill-equipped, dangerous. In this country it's not. In others, it's highly dangerous. You're not an expert or you're not qualified, as some of you have said. Fear of failure. Don't like people. Oh, that could be a reason, by the way. Uh, scared of being rejected. Your past is, in, in, is haunting you. Some issues. Worried about the follow-up. Scared of people's opinion of you. Don't believe that it is your calling. The pastor is there and he's paid to do the job, isn't he? A lie that is fed to most people's minds and difficult questions might come that I cannot answer now obviously this you can there's more that you can put in there but there are many reasons why Christians don't share their faith and you know what not one of them cut it when it comes to God I 
I believe the real reason why people don't share their faith are the following. They feel ill-equipped. They have an attitude problem. Hello? Fear they won't succeed. They don't really care about people. Not sure of their own salvation. Too busy and priorities are not straight. And have a compromising lifestyle where Satan condemns them and says, but you're not good enough. How dare you share? Can you relate to that, some of you? Yeah? Do you know those are lies? I think the, I think f probably the major one there is we feel we're too busy and, you know, we don't want to interfere in other people's lives. Right? I, was, I, was a, I took my two little boys to the dentist on Friday and my wife was also in town, so I wanted to swap cars and I wanted to take the bucky. So I went to Woolworths and I was st standing there in the queue, uh, and I was standing in the queue trying to, no, it wasn't, it was another day. I was, I was standing in the queue there, and I was with two of my sons there, and we were chatting, and I was looking through my phone, checking to see if I did my list, and this guy, there was a guy behind me that I've met before, but I can't remember his name. I'm terrible with names. But I had met, met him before, and I just said, hi, how are you? And, you know, small talk, and then I carried on checking through my list. And while we in the coming closer to the tool, and I felt I need to talk to him, but you know what? I didn't want to interfere in his life. So he says, says to me, tell me, how do, you, how do you say, how do you save a marriage? How do you make a marriage work? Those were his words to me. And I looked at him, and I said, hard work. And he starts talking to me about his marriage, just like a, I haven't seen him in years, this guy. Don't even know his name. Just like that. He, I am too shy and scared and I don't want him to, and I'm busy and I, I've got in, in a hurry, I have to get back home. And, and what happens? He. And I, I felt God said, you're out of line, you should have. But in any case, that's, that's beyond the point. So he comes to me and he asks me and I can minister to him. And at the end, I said to him, D divorce is not an option. And I s talked to him about certain things and that. And God, God, even though sometimes we are saying, you know, God will still open that door. But other times he doesn't. And I want to encourage you when there's an opportunity, use the opportunity that God affords us. Can I ask you, what on earth would be the point of studying to be a pilot and never flying a plane? You laugh. Oh my word. What is the point of ever marrying and never having children? Most parents, most couples want children. What is the point? Of becoming a fisherman and never fishing. Hello? I'm a fisherman, but I never ever cross the line. You're not a fisherman then. Likewise, what on, what's the point of becoming Christian if you never share your faith? Jesus said, not a disciple, Jesus said, you either gather with me or you scatter. In other words, you lead people to him. Or you chase people away from him. So what are you what are you gonna do? Hmm. Like I shared last week, not one of us was born able to read or write. Do not expect just to be able to lead people to the Lord. It takes a bit of effort. It takes a bit of learning of certain skills. But my question to you is, are you willing to learn some skills? Are you willing to put a bit of effort into acquiring those skills so that you can relay the gospel with some form of authority? Or should I say knowledge? The authority will come from Him. That's why I gave you, did everyone get a piece of uh, a paper that uh, has a whole lot of scriptures there. You all got those? I want to encourage you to learn some of them. You don't have to learn this scripture says this in the verse. 
Go and learn them that you have a brief understanding. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 it says the following. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. You and I as children of God are representatives of God. And I'm telling you now, if you are amb an ambassador of a nation, and we are an ambassador of the kingdom of God, if you are an ambassador that cannot give an answer on behalf of your country that is satisfactory, what on earth do you think your government is going to do to you? What's he going to do? Fire you. Recall you. Hey? We are ambassadors. As though with God we're saying, I want to speak through you. I want to use you to win the lost. To win this world. And if we all say, yes, I take on that responsibility, I will take that mandate and do it seriously, we'll see a major harvest coming in, I assure you. So my first point this morning is, Jesus', Jesus is first commandment. We read in Mark 1 verse 16 to 18, it reads as follows. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Right, who are the, who are the master anglers here? Can you put up your hand, please? Beth, Cliff is a master, I know, but he doesn't put up his hand. Van, come on. How do you catch a fish? You watch someone else doing it. Interesting. You sit, on the, you sit in the boat and you look at the beautiful lake and you admire it and you and admire your beautiful rod and you say, what a beautiful rod. The fish jumps and you say, what a beautiful fish. He's in need of coming into my boat, but he just doesn't want to jump in. Is that how you fish? Hello? Well, that's how we need to think like this, otherwise we're not going to get it. Well, how, how do you catch a fish? You put bait on a hook. You have to have a hook. Right? You have to have line. You have to put some bait on the hook. If you don't put... If you throw... A, a line in with a hook and no bait, no, which fish are you going to bite? You have to put in bait. And when you throw it in, you have to use certain techniques to draw certain fish, certain bait. Not all, not all lures, not all flies are equal. So if you want to catch a uh, 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 What's up? A marlin, you are not going to use a little fly this size. Come on. Those are for, for, for trout. You have to use different strategies, different ways to approach different people. Otherwise, you'll never hook them. Never ever. If you want to lead someone to the Lord and to and, and see them coming into the kingdom of God, you have to throw your line with some bait, or it will never happen. <sighs> Are we starting to get it? It's funny how God uses uh, things that we can understand to grasp it better. Hey? He says, come and I will make you fishers of men and immediately they could understand what he was saying but we hear it and we don't think a little bit deeper god wants us as his people to become fishers of men not me 
only all of us every single one of us Jesus last commandment John 1 verse 8 it says but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem in all Judea Samaria and to the ends of the earth he says I will empower you and I will empower you so that you can have goosebumps and feel nice and enjoy my presence. Is that what it says? Hello? Most of the church believe that. Oh, you know, they don't believe that. Well, I, don't, I, I see that being displayed as the truth in the natural. That's what I see. That scripture says he empowers us to be witnesses. That is the prime reason. To be proof producers of what he's done in our lives. That is why the Holy Spirit comes upon us. That is why he empowers us. So that we'll have the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit to see people come into the kingdom. That is the prime reason that you and I are filled with the Spirit of God. Number three, Jesus' great commission. I think all of us know it, but I'm still going to read it. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Therefore go. Do you know that that word go actually means in your everyday going? doesn't mean now I have to pack up and have a missionary trip to Mozambique or India or China. That's not what it says there. In your everyday going, in your everyday work, in your everyday play, in whatever you do, use the opportunities when you're standing in line at the bank or at Woolworths to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how about us putting our feelings aside and putting their salvation above our emotions above our feelings of maybe you're rejecting, even above our time constraints. In that previous scripture it says, and I, and I will empower you so that you can be witnesses in Jerusalem, in your town, in your local town, in Judea, in your province, in Samaria, in your country. And then it says, to the othermost parts of the earth. He wants to use us wherever we go. Not a compartmentalized, this is my Christian life, this is my daily life or my work life. It is all one. We are kingdom citizens before we are South African citizens. Amen? Number four, Jesus' early church. Listen to this because this will hit the the whole thing home. Here we see the scene of Stephen being stoned, and this is what it says. So old Saul, who be later becomes Paul, okay, was there giving approval to his death, to Stephen being stoning. He says, go for it. He gives his approval. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the main manna, of the church of that time. All the apostles, okay, all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. All of them were scattered out of that town and they were scattered all over Limpopo and all over South Africa. They were scattered all over. They didn't just stay in their town. They were scattered over their region and in their whole, their whole uh, uh, country that they lived. God allowed that so that his word could spread. Watch this. 
in Acts 8 verse 4 it says there, those who had been scattered, who were they? Not the apostles. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Wow. In other words, the common believer, not the clergy as many people put it, the laity, the, just, the, just you and I, normal Christians, they were scattered and they preached. And that's how the word of God spread. We, we need to thank Stephen that the word of God was spread so rapidly because he gave his life so that that could take place. But you see that it was not the apostles. It was the church members that were scattered. And they shared. Why? They shared because they didn't want to see people going to hell. And if we really understand the value of our salvation... And the cost of those not accepting Christ Jesus will be willing to share, I promise you, with anyone. <coughs> now, there are many diff there's so many different lines, and I, I mean, I will teach f for weeks and weeks on this, which obviously I'm not going to do. I might do one more next Sunday, and that's it. And then we'll end the series. But we have to put in time to learn how to share the gospel. If you want to see your family members that do not know God, you have to open your mouth. And you know them better than I do. Use the bait that they need. And the big guys that are highly intellectual, that are highly critical and agnostics and that, you're going to have to use better te techniques. In other words, you'll have to use a hook for a marlin and big bait. You can't use a little fly hook. It's not going to work. Those that are open and ready, fly hook will get them just like that. Let me, let me, let me share, share how, let's do an example of how you lead someone to the Lord. Can I do that? Who's going who's to be my, uh, what's the word, dummy? Who would like to, you would like to? You, you need to know you're going to go on, on TV, eh, on YouTube. Is that okay? Okay, come forward. You, ha you, you have to play as though you're non-believer though, okay? Right, come on. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to play, you can stand there, I'll stand here. Let's say we're in the streets now, okay? We're in the street, how am I going to approach him? I don't know him. Now, I, I just want you to know, I do believe that it's better, and it, I know it is, according to statistics and research fact, it is friends. When I'm a friend with someone, it is far easier to lead them to the Lord. Why? Because they're open to me. But does that mean that you cannot be in a line somewhere and share the gospel with someone or in the street and you feel this person is open and you use that opportunity? Okay? So I'm going to give you an example of one. How's that? Okay. So now, we will, now you have to play that you're a non-believer, okay? You got it? And you don't know much about God or anything. Right, right, here we go. Act one, scene one. Hi, hi, hi. I'm fine. Have you ever received your million dollar bill, a billion dollar bill? No, no, no. Here's a billion dollars for you, my friend. Okay. It's a gift from me to you. Oh, welcome. So you're a rich man now? God bless. Hey? Yeah. You're rich? Yeah, I'm rich. Oh, why? Why do you say you're rich? Oh, because mine, yeah. This billion dollar, on the back of that, there's some questions there. That if you understand them and know what they mean, it is worth more than a billion dollars. Can you imagine? Okay. Can I share with you some questions that you can understand better why I say what I say? Okay. I'd like to ask you, have you ever in your life told a lie? The lie? 
A lie? Yeah, I'm always lying. Have you told a lie before? Yeah, a lie, yeah. So, what do you call someone that has told a lie before? Come again. What do you, what do you, what do you say, what do you call someone that has told a lie before? Like a cheater, so someone that did somebody else a lie to do something, a liar. Okay, I'm going to do it with someone else because we're battling to understand you. Yeah, yeah, can we do that? Yeah, okay, okay, 100. I want to do it with someone else that I can understand and they can understand. Sorry, buddy. Okay, who can I use? Who, who, would, who would be willing to play with me? I want to start it again. Come on. Ah, oh, come on, man. Come, Sam. Okay. This is scene two now. <laughs> okay, now we're walking down the street. Hi, hi. Morning, morning. My name's Ian. Hi, Ian. Sam's the name. Uh, Sam, have you ever been given a million dollar bill? Ne never. Can I give you this as a yeah, gift? Sure, thanks. Sh tell me, uh, do you think you're rich now? Well, with a million dollars, yeah, it should be. There, on the back of that, there's some questions that if you could answer them, you would be, it would be worth more than that money that I'm giving you. Okay, what's the Can I share with them? You know, uh, tell me, have you ever told a lie before? Sure. So what do you call someone that has lied before? A liar. Okay. Tell me, have you ever maybe uh, looked at a woman lustfully? Absolutely. Do you know Jesus? Have you ever heard of him? Yes, I have. Jesus said, any person that has looked at a woman lustfully has committed adultery in his heart. Tell me, uh, have you ever taken something from someone that is not yours? Yes, sure. What do we call someone that does uh, that? Thief. A thief? Oh, my hat. Okay, sure. Well, have you ever maybe said God's name in vain? Yes. Well, what do you call someone that does that? It's blasphemy or something like that. Blasphemy. Yeah, so, uh, look, I'm not accusing you. Not at all. But, um, you know, the... From what you've said, it seems to me that you say, I'm not saying, you say that you are a lying, adulterous, um, what, do you, what the other one was there? A thief, a thief yeah, and a, a, bliss, no. a, 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 a an adulterer. Which, are you all of those? Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah. So now tell me, do you think that you will go to heaven? Okay, let me ask you, if you, say now you um, did something terribly wrong to someone and you're in the court and the judge finds you guilty and he says you are to pay that person one billion dollars or you're going to jail, yeah. what would then happen? happen? You would go to, go, go to jail? Say now you had to say to him, but you know, I'm not such a bad person, I'm quite a good guy, you know, after all, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I acknowledge I've been wrong and I've done wrong, but I'm good to people and everything. Do you think that the judge is going to say, okay, you can go scot free, don't worry, you... No, it's not, because I did wrong. And you didn't pay the price, not no. so. H however, say now someone had to walk in to the courtroom with a whole lot of suitcases, open it and say, there's one billion dollars, I pay the fine for you. What would happen? What would the judge then say? Can go. He would say, you can go scot-free, isn't it? You're off the hook. Why? Because the price was paid. Yeah. But if you had to say, mm -mm, I don't believe that, that, those one dollar, those, that billion dollars is fake, I don't believe that, I don't want it, thank you. What will happen? You'll have to pay the price. And that is the same in life. You, we went through four of the Ten Commandments, only four. And do you realize that you failed in all four, just like I myself do? Yeah. Every single one of those. Did you understand that that is disobedience to God, to God and that is what we call sin? Yes, and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. In other words, the price that you have to pay is your life. Yeah. But God knew that, so he sent his one and only son to pay that price for you. But if you do not accept the gift of his life, you have to pay with your own life. So yep. So tell me, would you like to accept the gift that he has given through his son, or you want to pay with your own life? No, 
Can I share with you uh, a little bit more? Sure. Do you see what, do you, do you understand? Now he's already thinking. So now I can use this as a platform and I can start saying, right, let me share, for instance, maybe the John 3.16. There are others that would immediately say, yes, I, I want to accept that gift. Now he says he has to think about it, right? Then I'll say, okay, can I share some more with you if he has time? Because now we're on the street. If he says yes, then I, then I take it to where he's at. I need to assess, does he understand the scriptures? The, where's his knowledge of God? What is, does he have any knowledge? Some people know nothing. If you say Jesus, they don't even know his name. So where, you have to assess where he's at, what is his belief system, etc., etc. And then accordingly, you take him. But if you can get him to an understanding that he's a sinner and he needs a savior, you are halfway there. So once, it, because now he's already starting to think, you want to get them to a point where they realize you cannot just get scot free. You can, you know, when there's, there's the judgment sentenced. If you, what's that saying that goes, if you commit the crime, you have to do the time. Right? You and I have committed the crime of sin. And the penalty, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God, however, is eternal life through Jesus Christ. He is willing to pay the price. Yes. If he says to you, um, no, I don't, I don't care about that. If you die, you're dead. If you die, you're dead. No. There's no heaven, there's no hell. Yeah, but then you have to take him to a point where you've got to then show him why it is a heaven, why it is a hell. You've got to then you've got to you've got to meet him where he's at. You cannot say, "Oh, but you're crazy! How can you think like that?" How, the, of course, is it? you cannot do that. You've got to then theologically you, and that's why I'm saying you've got to go and do a little prep work, and so that you are ready to share your the, your faith. But you, even in the natural, you need to understand there's a price to pay. You cannot do something wrong. And there's no penalty. So you and I do something wrong. What is the penalty? Nothing? Yes, love. Sorry, I think just use the mic, love. Um, we need to realize that you know, sometimes when you fish, the first the first worm gets nibbled, and the second worm gets nibbled, and the third worm, you're sitting there for hours, and then finally you catch that fish. So we have to woe people in. Sometimes it's a slow process by your act of kindness, your prophetic word that you give them, you know. It's not an instant thing always. So w you take it step by step. Amen. That's very true. That is very true. Especially with the closest people to you. They're, they're open to you, but it's not just going to happen. They'll, they'll maybe nibble, nibble, and you can see if they start asking questions, you can know. And if you do not know a thing, be honest. Just say, I don't know, can, but I will find out and I'll come back to you. And when you say, I'll come back to you, you make sure you go back to them. And you make sure you go back to them with the truth. And not just a willy-nilly, wishy-washy explanation. You go and do your research and your homework. Could all of you have done what I did there? If, they, if someone's an expert on a specific area like evolution, then you go and you research evolution till you understand what you believe with regards to evolution. Because you can be a Christian and believing in certain uh, aspects of evolution and certain times. There are many different uh, views on evolution. So you're going to have to do your research that you can give an answer why and how come, why you believe what you believe and why he's belief system in evolution is flawed. Okay?
You see, everyone, you've got to take every point, every guy accordingly. Um, I think we need to understand that if you, you see, this is the problem, that he, that a person like that blames God for the condition of the world. In other words, they blame the, 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 the violence and the abuse of society and people on God. However, God didn't make those choices. The evil heart to heart of man made those choices. And you've got to get him to a point where he understands that and grasps that. And understand that God sits back and waits. He doesn't, he, 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 when he created Adam and Eve, he said, you go and take dominion. He didn't say, and he said, you go and call, he didn't say, I'm going to call all the animals and tell you how to do this. He says, you go and have to take dominion. So he, he, in other words, he gives authority to mankind. And if we stuff up, we cannot then blame him. And this is what the world does. So you have to meet that person where he's at. Do your research that you can eventually hook that person. Yes, Linda. That's also another option. Can I bring my friend and we'll come and chat to you? 100%. In reincarnation. Well, you've got to, you've got to get to them where they, exactly they believe and then you, you, you speak to them to where, where their flaw is in their belief system. That's where you're speaking to. Yes, love. Yeah. 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 Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Ask God, is this person right? Are they ready? One of the greatest questions you can ask someone. If you had to know, do you believe in God? Yes. If, if there were, and if he says no, then you say to him, if there was this God who loved you with all of his heart and was desperate to know you, would you want to know him as well? I can tell you now they're going to say yes. Then you can spin the question. And then you say, okay, say now this God who wants to know you and love you with all of his heart and wants you to know him and you've said yes. What happens if he had to say, but I expect you to obey me? Would that change the scenario? And they will say yes. In other words, they do not want to know the truth. Have you got it? Those type of people do not want to know the truth. Why? Because they are not prepared to change their life. And you throw them that question. So in other, in other, then you know that they are not ready at all for you to share the gospel and leave them alone. Literally, yeah, you have to wipe your, the, the, the dust off your feet. They are not open at all. You will be throwing pearls before swine and they're going to abuse you. And then you must expect a punishment <laughs> because it's going to come. Yes, Linda. Yes, you see, that's the thing. And God can use that. God can use that seed that because you've challenged him. Say, so if God really, if there's a God, and then you say, but, so in other words, your motive is you're actually not really interested. You live purely for yourself. You're your own God. And then leave them. Okay. Yes, Simon. Sure. I'd just also like to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a bass fisherman, so I'm quite confident to go out to Ebenezer Dam, for instance, and go and fish for bass. But put me on my boat with my equipment out in the deep sea, I'm most likely not going to come back. Um, besides the fact that you're going to get discouraged, I would encourage you guys to, to go to places where you feel familiar. Go to people that you know in your work surroundings. Go to those people. Don't, don't try and go and approach somebody from the occult and, and try and do your work there because you will get demoralized. 
there you need to take somebody that knows that area and go with them. If I want to go deep sea fishing, I'll get somebody that knows that and go with them so that they can teach me. Great wisdom given there, hey? Stay on the small little dams until you're confident to go to sea. And even then, go with someone. Don't go and do street evangelism until you're ready and you know your story, even better than what I did here. Okay. You want to do say something, young? Yeah, come here. Justin will decide, okay? Um, you know what? In in, in my shop, Lady Blue, we minister to people all the time. It's a shop. And we normally wait until they're paid. And God uses sometimes prophecy, sometimes acts of kindness. And people will come in there, and then I'm there sometimes, and they'll stop and they, they look at me and say, where's your mom? Because they've come for ministry. They have come with their problems and their, their heart ache. And they'll say, no, no, she's not here, but come tell me what's wrong. And we pray for people. It is a shop. It is business. But what God needs us to do comes before any sales that we make. Okay, so that is what it means when they say in your everyday going. And I thought you called to, to aren't you called to make profit and money? Yes, but you can, they can, uh, they can survive in perfect harmony. But how do you mix the two? Surely you should mix the two. People are important. Are they more important than profit? Yes. To you and to God? Yes. That's the problem. That is the problem. For most of us, not. We value our time more, our comfort more, our DSTV more, etc., etc. And you, you can go on, our golf more, our whatever. How much do you value that person? And seeing them coming into the kingdom of God. In other words, going to heaven. Because the alternative to that is going to hell. I would rather have nothing. I'd rather have nothing. And you would rather not have a sale in a shop than lead someone to the Lord. She would far prefer leading someone to the Lord. Why? Because their soul is more important. And I pray that God will change our paradigm of thinking, that we will yearn to see people coming into the kingdom of God. We've got to ask God once again to, to impregnate a passion for the lost. Are you willing to do that? It's going to take a bit of work and effort to acquire the skills. Hitchhikers. Oh yeah, they, oh, because you've got them. I used to be the hitchhiker and I did it the other way around. Yeah, I had a, I had a captive audience. Also, awesome opportunity. Sure. I've had guys in Ashia and they cry, they're crying and driving. And I'm saying, yeah, God, this is amazing. When I was a very new Christian, I didn't know very much at all. And I was just on fire for the Lord. And I hope I'm still as much on fire as I was then. I was driving from Salisbury to, or Harare to Mutari, I'm trying to think of the names as they are now, um, and there was a guy hitchhiking. Picked him up and we drove along and I was thinking to myself now, how am I going to approach this guy and ask him if he knows the Lord? So I said to him, do you know Jesus? He said, you know, I've been sitting here ever since I got in this car trying to think, how am I going to ask this man, does he know Jesus? He was actually a Catholic priest. He was born again. <laughs> okay, so I want to encourage you. You've got some homework. Okay. You're back at school. I'm not a good fisherman of fish, but I, can, I have fished for men, and I have people in this congregation I've led to the Lord and in other congregations. 
but you have to go and acquire the skill. And if you are not good at it, go and find a good fisherman of men and ask them to help you. Until you feel ready and then you go for it. Will you do it? I want to encourage you, learn those scriptures. You don't have to learn all of them. Choose a few that you're comfortable with. Practice different diagrams of John 3.16. Practice, go and look on YouTube with this, what I shared with you. Go and get a fay with it and lead people to the Lord. And we will see this. Let's do that in the next year. Let's multiply ourselves. Let's give birth to just one spiritual child. Just one. Can we do that? Who's going to do that? Who's going to take up that challenge? One, this in the next year. By next year, August, I'm going to lead at least one person to the Lord. You're going to do it? Father, I thank you for every person here. I thank you, Lord, for your word and the, the challenging, the way that you challenge every single one of our hearts. And forgive us where we've been poor fishers of men. Forgive us where, in some cases, we've not even fished for men. But Lord, we pray that you would equip us in the days and the weeks that lie ahead to be great fishers of men. And that we would learn the different baits that are available to hook different people. And that we will learn to meet people where they're at. And Lord, that we will not shy away from speaking the truth in love and challenging people. That we may see them transferred from the kingdom of darkness into your most amazing light into the kingdom of heaven. We thank you, Lord, that one day when you take us home, that we will have been successful because we will fulfill the calling upon our lives. And we'll have a train of souls walking into heaven with us. So we pray you prepare us, give us understanding and wisdom. We pray you'd bless this day and this week that lies ahead Till we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Enjoy your tea and coffee. See you next Sunday.